you have the floor. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody to my talk on insights and experiences from monitoring multiple peer-to-peer -peer botnets. This is joint work between me, Leon Böck, Shankar Karupaya, Valentin Sundermann, Max Mühlhäuser and Dave Levin. So we come from three universities. I'm from TU Darmstadt in Germany and Dave is from University of Maryland and Shankar is from University of Sense Malaysia. So maybe you heard about the tale of the blind man and the elephant. And it goes something like that, that there is an elephant coming into town and there are six blind men that are supposed to describe what is an elephant. And each of them touches a different part of the elephant, like the face, the leg, the tail, or the body of the elephant, and they each describe a different thing, even though it's all the elephant, but they just don't see the big picture. So from our past research into peer-to-peer -peer botnets, we have the feeling that this is a similar analogy there where looking at a single botnet doesn't tell you the whole picture, and you may think that a specific thing of that botnet is generalizable, even though it isn't. So some of the questions we would really like to answer in our research is how similar or how dissimilar are peer-to-peer -peer botnets in respect to like which devices are affected, how is the behavior over time, what are the affected regions, and what are the dynamics in terms of bots coming online, going offline, new IP addresses being assigned, et cetera. So there have been two great works in the research community, namely peer to peer by Rousseau et al. and long-term tracking and characterization of peer-to-peer -peer botnets by Jan et al. But those are almost 10 years back now, and a lot of things have changed in the peer-to-peer -peer and botnet um, world in general, uh, specifically when it comes to IoT botnets. So we want to investigate them in more detail. However, when it comes to monitoring many, many botnets at the same time, there are significant challenges that are mainly related to effort. So the first one is human effort. For any botnet that is out there, we need to reverse it, figure out what's the peer-to-peer -peer communication protocol, then we implement crawlers and sensors, and then we analyze the data. This requires lots of human effort and is not always available. And then secondly, we have resource constraints, such as if we monitor a lot of botnets of significant size, we need many machines, many IP addresses, and lots of network resources to cover all these botnets at a high enough speed. And then comes another problem of anti-monitoring mechanisms, where some of these bot masters implement rate limiting features or even block lists based on crawlers requesting too frequently. So that, again, requires us to um, add additional crawlers and sensors to not be detected and blocked. So we developed a system called the Botnet Monitoring System where we try to address these five uh, problems highlighted in blue by making a generic approach to as much as possible so we only have to do the detailed work for as little as possible. I don't know where the flickering comes from. Um, but just a quick recap on peer-to-peer -peer botnets, so we're all on the same page. Generally, we can, uh, can uh, like categorize them based on how they are built. So there's unstructured peer-to-peer -peer botnets, where there's usually a custom gossiping protocol that creates more or less random connections between bots, and each error um, denotes that one of these bots knows one of the other bots. Then we have structured peer-to-peer -peer botnets that, for example, we use the uh, Kademlia DHT, to build a more structured and well-defined peer-to-peer network. And there's also parasitic botnets where the bots just leverage one of the existing peer-to-peer um, -peer networks, such as the BitTorrent DHT, to forward their commands and exfiltrate data. So how do we collect our data? Um, we mainly use crawlers and sensors. And what a crawler does is that given a bootstrap peer, we just start asking that peer, what other bots do you know in the network? And they will eventually reply to us and we can iteratively um, do that with all the bots we know and eventually enumerate the entire botnet. Sensors follow in a similar pattern, but they are more passive and initially initiate connections and then wait for bots to actually communicate to them and they act more like they are a real bot and forward and discuss, like, actually look at the commands and forward them eventually and interact with the bots where a crawler just uh, requests and handles the replies. So now coming to the botnet monitoring system, uh, I told you that we're trying to like 
remove redundant effort wherever possible. And on the left side here, called BMS, Abundant Monitoring System, we have a backend that consists of several Docker containers, such as Grafana Visualization, a database component, and several analytics um, containers that run automatically on all the data we collect and um, provide it to us to easily look at what's going on. Then we have an API through which the backend communicates with the crawlers and sensors. And then we have like generic implementations for the crawlers or the sensors where the entire connection to the backend, the queuing of, of the peers and the removal of inactive peers, everything like that is taken care of. So we only have to implement the protocol specific parts for any of these botnets to start tracking them more quickly. I will go to in, into a little more details of all these components, but before that, I will try to give you a live overview of the data we're collecting. So here you can see one of our main dashboards where I'm showing you on top the number of unique IPs our entire system gets on a daily basis. So we have an average of 50,000 unique IPs that we're tracking and we get a total of 12 million replies to the requests we send out. Coming to the botnets that we're tracking, currently we're tracking five botnets. The first one is a Mosi botnet, which is a Mirai-like um, IoT botnet that uses peer-to-peer -peer for communication. Hajime, once again, is a Mirai-like peer-to-peer botnet using peer-to-peer -peer for communication. And then we have three smaller botnets, namely Hide and Seek, DDG, and Celity that are also peer-to-peer -peer botnets, but much smaller than the former two. So one thing that we find very interesting looking at these graphs over the last six months is that we can only see a decline for the Celity botnet, which has been around since 2008, and since then, from what we have seen over the past years, has been steadily declining. But what, what confuses us a lot is that, for example, the Mosi botnet, the botmasters have been arrested last year, and we don't see any significant downtrend here. The first initial jump um, in the beginning of November, or end of November is because we updated our crawler and it got more efficient. And then the same for the Hajime botnet. We haven't seen any updates from the botmaster since 2018, but yet it's still seemingly not going down at all. However, I want to go into another dashboard that is more in line with what I wanted to show you today, and that is the comparison dashboard that we have. So here you can select two botnets that you want to compare against each other, like right now Mosi and Hajime are selected because those are the biggest botnets that we're tracking currently. And the first thing that I want to talk about is up here in the aggregate statistics that Mosi has uh, 15,000 unique IPs per hour on average. Well, not on average, maximum unique IPs was 15,000, but the maximum unique IDs we observed was only 13,795. So why are there less IDs than IP addresses? This is probably related to IP address reassignment policies from many ISPs out there. And by itself, it isn't very confusing. However, if we then look at Hajime, which has the statistics down here, we actually see that it's fewer unique IP addresses than unique IDs. So why is this um, turned around in this case? And what we're assuming is that uh, Hajime is affecting more carrier grade NAT um, autonomous systems where multiple infections share one public IP among each other. And another explanation could be that the instability of the Hajime botnet, um, it crashes sometimes, and then if it crashes, it will have a new ID upon reboot and reinfection. But nevertheless, we can say, just from looking at this, that an apples to apples comparison of, let's say, IP addresses or even IDs is not always an accurate comparison when we look at the size of peer to peer botnets. The second thing I want to talk about is a very interesting pattern that we see for Mosi, um, where like once daily we have this spike where we almost get twice as many replies back from the bots than at any other time during the day, and we don't see a similar behavior for Hajime. So when we were investigating this, we actually found that it's just a single ISP in China causing most of this, um, these spikes here. And looking further, we found out that other have, others have reported already that some ISPs in China throttle the internet bandwidths to the outside world during China daytime. So this is actually happening from 8 p.m. to 1 a.m. in Europe. 
but that matches uh, 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. in China and is most likely um, because the throttling is not active during these times, which is allowing us to get about twice as many requests in. Once again, we don't see it for Hajime because Hajime is actually not infecting many devices in that autonomous system, so it's not very pronounced. The second thing that I want to talk about is um, that we see like a clear diurnal pattern in the number of unique IPs we see for Mosi on a daily basis, but once again, we don't see it at all for Hajime. So when we investigated this, we once again found that it's related to a single country in that case, which is India, that has a diurnal pattern that matches the uh, global pattern seen in the Hajime plot very accurately. So seeing this, we were expecting, okay, let's, let's look at what's going on in Hajime because we would expect to see this once again. But if we now look at the unique IPs for India and Hajime, we once again see that there's almost no discernible diurnal pattern and only artifacts from our crawler and the crashes. So once again, what we learned from this is just because two botnets infect machines in the same country doesn't mean that the behavior of the machines that are affected are equal and comparable at all cases, and you oftentimes have to dig much deeper if you want to understand the botnets in detail. So the last thing that I want to talk about is the uh, world maps that you can see here. And once again, Mosi and Hajime are very different here. So for Mosi, we see that 8,000 of the infections are located in China, whereas for Hajime, we actually only have below 100 average uh, infections that we can observe in China. Contrary, China has a lot of infections, uh, Hajime has a lot of infections in Iran, where once again, Mosi almost has no infections at all. And apart from these like big focused countries for, for each of these malware types, we can see that Hajime is much more spread across the entire world with several countries having more than 100 infections and Mosi being almost only located in these three hotspots that we can see, which are India, Russia, and China, with very few uh, infections outside of them. So with that, I'll jump back to my presentation. So once again, here I just wanted to show you some of the investigations that weren't done on the dashboard. And we can see that the autonomous system with 4837, which is located in China, uh, shows these spikes in green, which, which we've seen previously in the dashboard for the replies. And here's the work by Zhu et al, which have observed this great bottleneck of China, which they call it, which is related to um, internet traffic going to outside of China being throttled during daytime. So coming back to some of the details for the button monitoring system. Some of the things, like the, one of the very first things we had to do when we, we, we embarked upon this work is how do we analyze all of these botnets at the same time in a meaningful way? And what we came towards is that we need a common database format. So while we would usually love to have all the information we could possibly get, to make them comparable and easily storable in the same database, we decided to have a common database format that is similar across all botnets. So one of the things we're storing are called replies, which is just any kind of interaction with the bot at the specified time. So this could be collected by a crawler sending out a request and getting a valid reply, by a sensor being contacted by one of the infected machines, by a honeypot getting a valid interaction or like a um, network telescope being attacked by a known fingerprint of a malware. And that could all be stored in there and then easily be replicated to be shown and compared in these dashboards that we use. And also a lot of our aggregate functions and analysis uh, works on this data type. And then the second more specific to peer-to-peer um, -peer botnets are edges, where we actually record that a bot X was connected to a bot Y at a certain point in time, which helps us to look at how the messages spread within these peer-to-peer -peer networks and general graph analysis and analysis of the resilience of these botnets and potential um, sync holding or partitioning attacks. And this kind of data is usually only collected by crawlers. 
So one of the, the questions you may ask is why didn't we just go for the simple solution with our backend and set up like a database where all of our crawlers can connect to easily? And the, there are several drawbacks, which is why we didn't choose that. So the first one is that we wouldn't have any way of validating or authenticating um, the data that's coming in. So if we want to open up this system to have collaboration across our universities, and with, with people we don't know, we want to have the ability to validate the data that is coming in so we don't uh, put a lot of wrong data into our database, which is one of the reasons. Then just having a database would be a kind of one-way communication where you can deliver data, but you cannot tell the crawlers what to do. And so no coordination would be possible, which is one of our planned next steps where we want to actually use the backend to tell the crawlers what to do and how to do it so we can circumvent countermeasures like rate limiting by spreading out the load among many crawlers at the same time or dynamic resource allocation in the sense that if one botnet starts to grow significantly and we need more crawlers focusing on that, we can do it automatically from the backend and kind of tell the satellites what to do. And that's why we chose to implement a custom API which is written in Golang using gRPC. Then I've talked about how the base crawler um, is supposed to be as generic as possible and cover all these things that you would have to implement multiple times. And among these features that we've implemented there is the backend and API connection to talk to the BMS backend. Um, we have implemented queuing and parallelized crawling so we can run easily 20,000 simultaneous connections and not be slowed down too much by peers responding very slowly. We also implemented a logic that's uh, parameterized to remove un uh, unresponsive peers. So let's say uh, an infected machine changes its IP address. We don't want to indefinitely spam the old IP address with our requests. So we have put some logic there on when to get rid of that. Um, we also support TCP and UDP-based peer-to-peer botnets, and for UDP, we implemented a custom retry mechanism that is sim similar to TCP retries. So if one message gets dropped because of network outages or general network issues, we will try again and try again just to verify that the peer is actually offline if we don't get a reply in that case. And then lastly, we use um, a two-queue system, which I will explain in a little more detail on the next slide because in the past we have realized that unresponsive peers can uh, slow down our crawling by so much that we wanted to get a way around that. So the, the idea that we have is we, we split the monitoring into two loops and we have a discovery loop that is fed with either a seed list of peers when we first start crawling and after that we put in all newly found peers into that discovery loop. And the discovery loop is kind of like it, it can be slow, we don't mind too much, but it, it essentially tries to do the first connection to any of the infected devices. And as soon as we get a valid reply, we will put it into the tracking loop, which is only full of responsive peers, so we don't have long response times and wait for inactive peers to never respond. And there we can even increase the crawling speed at which we're working. And once we, we, um, we observe a peer going inactive, it will go back into the discovery loop where it will eventually be removed if it hasn't been seen for whatever specified time period. So the spike that I've shown you previously where our Mosey crawler um, got about 5,000 peers more per hour is actually due to a change in this base crawler. And then last but not least for that, um, just a quick example of what we can do with this base crawler setup. And for the hide-and-seek botnet, which has arguably a very simple protocol, what you see on the right is the entirety of the code to make the crawler work with hide-and-seek, where we simply implement the send peer request and read reply methods, which are then called from the base crawler and automatically processed and sent to the database. So what are some of the ongoing and future work that we're doing with botnet monitoring system? The first thing we're looking into is automating the measurement of churn and lifetimes. So we want to know for how long do bots stay up in one of these botnets and when do they leave and at what rates and what patterns do they do that. And then the second thing is uh, implement some of the sensor and crawler detection work that we've done in the past 
um, firstly, to analyze if we can actually detect ourselves, and if this is the case, then the bad guys can probably detect us as well if they wanted to, so we can try to be more stealthy in that sense. And we can also filter out the activities of other researchers, which are sometimes very noisy in the data set and actually um, mess up some of the analytics. And lastly, uh, one of the most thought after features for this system is coordination, where we want to implement like dynamic load allocation to the crawlers so we can share the load and circumvent anti-monitoring mechanisms like rate limiting or blacklisting features. If you liked what you're seeing, um, we're happy to collaborate directly with you, give you access to the data. Uh, we're not making it public because I would like to check that the person asking for the data is actually not a criminal. Um, we're also happy to share the source code with you. If you don't want to collaborate with us on, on our system, you could set up your own system and run it. Um, we will make dashboards publicly available soon after this talk, and just contact us at botnets at tk.to-darmstadt.de. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, questions on the left. Um, Vitaly, uh, quick question. Thank you for the talk. Amazing graphics, by the way. Uh, visualization is cool. Uh, question is, have you ever experienced any kind of active countermeasures from the bot herders to kind of try and prevent you from collecting information about the botnet size and so on? And maybe if you may, another question at the same time. Um, do you also track the commands that are issued to the bots and how quickly they are propagated across different types of botnets? So regarding the first question, the two big ones we're tracking right now are seemingly dead or dead for sure because the bot masters have been arrested. So I don't, I don't see any active pushback there. Um, but for the DDG botnet, they did a lot of evolutions in the peer-to-peer -peer protocol when we first started looking at it. And the hide-and-seek botnet, for example, implements um, rate limiting based on the requesting IP addresses. So, so there are countermeasures, but we haven't been targeted specifically yet. And the second question was? Have you seen commands? I, uh, the, the command tracking. So for the Sality botnet, we're actually checking when a new command is being spread and when we see it first. But we haven't analyzed the data in detail yet. And for the other ones, um, as I said, they, they're not being developed actively. So we have a difficult time doing that right now. OK, another question. One, two, three. Wake up. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.